Hey, Vetfolio Voice fam, how you doing? Anyone out there managing a kitty with chronic kidney disease who is progressively becoming more and more anemic? Well, if so, you've tuned into the right episode. This episode is sponsored by Elanco and features Dr. Shelley Vaden here to talk about a super exciting breakthrough in managing anemia in cats with CKD. Now, I talk about this a little bit in the episode, but I start getting really tense when I see progressive anemia in a cat with CKD because our options for managing it in the past present some very real challenges, some of which we touch on in this episode. This is especially true as IRIS guidelines continue to be updated and suggest that we may need to be more aggressive and start treating anemia earlier. Well, like I said, exciting news. Varenzin CA1, or Melitostat Oral Suspension, is a once-daily oral medication designed to help patients utilize their endogenous iron stores maybe more effectively in order to produce more red blood cells and help treat that anemia. I think this is so exciting to have a once-daily oral medication option. In my humble opinion, I think it will make it so much easier to intervene a little bit earlier in these kitties and get a jump on that anemia from the start. Dr. Shelley Vaden is a professor of small animal internal medicine at the North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine. She graduated from the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine, went on to pursue an internship at Cornell University and a residency in small animal internal medicine and PhD at North Carolina State University. The focus of Dr. Vaden's scholarly and clinical activities has primarily been diseases of the kidney and lower urinary tract of dogs and cats, and she has extensively published in this area. Dr. Vaden is a founding member and president-elect of the American College of Veterinary Nephrology and Urology, a member and president-elect of the Internal Renal Interest Society Management Board, and a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Honestly, her bio doesn't do her justice. She's brilliant and so nice to talk to. Let's go ahead and learn about this exciting new drug. For this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Shelley Vaden, and we're going to talk about Varenzin CA1, or Melitostat Oral Suspension, which is a super exciting new option for helping to treat our feline patients with CKD. So, Shelley, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. Oh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thrilled to have you. You know, the burning question in all of our minds is, what is Varenzin CA1? Well, Varenzin CA1 is indicated for the control of non-regenerative anemia associated with chronic kidney disease in cats. Basically, it's really exciting because it's a novel approach to treating um, or managing the anemia associated with chronic kidney disease. And it basically inhibits an inhibitor. And what that allows it to do is stabilize hypoxia-inducible factor. And hypoxia-inducible factor is the agent that really is responsible for stimulating the production of erythropoietin. The other thing that it does is it suppresses hepcidin and hepcidin is a very important regulator of iron. And when hepcidin is increased as can happen with inflammatory diseases or reduction in GFR, then iron becomes sequestered. And so by having the combination of increasing of erythropoietin and mobilizing iron stores more effectively, it really does allow us to manage anemia of chronic kidney disease in a way that we have not had available to us in the past. Well, I'm so happy to hear you kind of explain what it is and and how it's working, because when it first kind of hit my radar that there was potentially another drug to help manage anemia in cats with CKD. I, you know, I was all excited because it can really be challenging. So before we get into some of the challenges that can come along with managing kitties with CKD and their anemia, can you remind us why are we concerned about anemia in cats with CKD? Anemia really contributes to the morbidity of this disease more than we have given it credit to for in the past. Cats that have anemia, they're more cold intolerant, their appetites reduce, they're not as playful, they're not as interactive with their owners. So they really are suffering a lot more from chronic kidney disease when they have anemia associated with it. And then the other thing is that it's been shown in cats that anemia is associated with worse outcomes. They're more likely to die more quickly when they have anemia of chronic kidney disease. 
Okay. And you know, that makes sense. I think that's something we probably all see clinically in cats with CKD, um, bearing my soul once again on the podcast here. Sometimes though, it like when I see that anemia, it can make me want to play ostrich a little bit. Like I just want to pretend like it's not as bad as what I'm seeing on the blood work because the options can be kind of challenging for managing anemia in these kitties and going over that with owners and you know, having the buy-in there. So can you remind us what our options have been in the past prior to Varenz and CA1? Yeah, um, I'm glad you bared your soul there because it does bring <laughs> up the important point that we probably need to treat earlier than we have. And um, classically, you know, we start talking about it when their PCV is 20 to 25, but um, there's starting to be some evidence that even when their PCV is less than 28, the um, anemia starts to contribute to morbidity and their quality of life. So what we've had to use in, um, available to us in the past is the um, human recombinant erythropoietin or epigen. And it was um, quickly shown that a percentage of those cats would develop antibodies that would make them be, become transfusion dependent even. So it really wasn't the best choice for managing the anemia. And then um, darbopoietin was available and darbopoietin a fair number of animals will respond to that, but some of them still do not respond, um, perhaps because of hepcidin or, or other comorbidities, but a percentage of them will just not respond to this agent. It does require injections, usually to be given weekly during induction and then every one to three weeks, depending on what kind of response we're seeing during maintenance. And really, if you follow FDA guidelines, the vial is a single use vial. Many people try to skirt that by keeping the vial on the shelf and taking multiple doses from that, but that really is an off-label usage of the drug. And that is a great summary of why it, my instinct sometimes is to play ostrich when I see that anemia because, because it has been really challenging. Can you clarify just a little bit with the EPO? I'm just curious, when you say transfusion dependent, does that mean these cats are going after their own red blood cells? They were. So there's neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibodies against the um, erythrocyte stimulating agents, which epigen, darbopoietin, those are called ESAs. And um, we've never documented for sure that those antibodies occur against darbopoietin, but we know they occur against epigen. And so some of these cats um, would develop antibodies and just stop responding to the agents. So it would just be to the agents, but others would develop these neutralizing antibodies that would actually cross-react with erythropoietin. And those cats would develop pure red cell aplasia. And even after you started the epigen, it um they they wouldn't bounce back they would be remain transfusion dependent oh gosh that's scary yes Happy i have not encountered that um to this so but but now of course we have this new drug that's coming available to use for anemia in these ckd kitties so what makes friends and ca1 different well, again, it's, it stimulates them to produce their own erythropoietin. And we don't know what the side effects of our, are of having these really high spurts of erythropoietin that are produced by something like darbopoietin. But we know in people that that can have some, some negative consequences. And so it, it's more physiological to do, induce your own erythropoietin production, which is what that this drug allows them to do. They um, now utilize their iron stores more effectively. So again, not only are they ha stimulating the erythropoietin, but their iron stores are becoming more mobilized so that they can, can actually have erythrogenesis. And it's an oral medication that can be given at home. Oh my good. That was going to be my next question is how is, how is it given? Because we've talked about injections and you know, dosing schedules and monitoring and things like that with some of these other drugs. If this is an oral medication, sounds like it's probably an easier drug to administer. Yes, it is supposed to be very palatable. I haven't tasted it myself, but it is um, a fish <laughs> flavor and the um, cats in the studies are supposed to have really liked the flavor of it. So administration should not be difficult. It's given once daily for 28 days right now because it is under conditional approval. It is required that there is a pause for seven days. Then you can monitor these patients. And when the Paxil volume starts to fall again, which it will likely happen without continued drug administration, after that seven-day pause, you can reinstitute it. And then if at any time they become polycythemic during treatment, so a Paxil volume greater than 45 then um, you would also pause it. And it, the pause is in order to try to avoid them becoming polycythemic. That's correct. 
Okay. And, and just to reiterate what you said, polycythemia in these guys is going to be a pack cell greater than 45%. So we're not talking about like the 60 plus percent we would talk about in cats without CKD. That is correct. Okay. Um, and you said it's given once daily. Yes, it's given um, once daily and it is able to be kept on the shelf. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. There's no needles, n nothing that makes it difficult to give. And I guess that might be something to talk about. Are there any side effects that um, have been noted leading up to um, this drug becoming available? So the only thing that that's been reported is vomiting and, or the main thing that's been reported is vomiting. And the problem with vomiting when you're talking about chronic kidney disease or cats in general is that they vomit, right? And it's associated with the disorder. So it's a little bit hard to sort out if it's a direct effect of the drug, at least in my opinion or not, but vomiting is the most common effect. Um, I think you have to be concerned about hypertension. Anytime we stimulate the erythron, that there is a potential to worsen hypertension. And um, what we've seen in animals that are given erythropoiesis stimulating agents is that can happen pretty quickly as their red blood cell mass comes up. Um, and so even though hypertension was not directly linked, linked to this drug, I think because we're stimulating the erythron, you have to be worried about it. And then also any of the erythrons, erythropoiesis stimulating agents that have been used in cats and people, there's a, a link with seizures. And um, seizures were seen in the initial studies, but it was a very low rate and it could have been from the uremia or it could have been from hypertension. So it's again, nothing that I would directly say is a direct cause of this drug. So when we're talking about hypertension, secondary to stimulating the erythron, is there any data to say, is that like a transient hypertension as these patients adjust to having a higher red blood cell mass? Or do we not know? Is that just something we have to monitor and treat? Well, I don't know the answer to that. It may be Fair. that uh, somebody else knows the answer to that, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I do think that it's something that you need to really watch out for and monitor. And again, it might even be that um, we need to reconsider our RS guidelines about hypertension when these patients are getting erythrocyte stimulating agents. And um, again, when we're managing their anemia, because they might not be ones, they might not be ones that we want to wait quite so long while we're trying to make sure that they don't have situational hypertension. In other words, that when we suspect hypertension, we might act a little bit more quickly when we're giving an ESA. Absolutely. And uh, I know we did a talk with Dr. Sleed. We've talked to him a couple of times about kidneys and he's kind of alluded to the fact that there's a lot of kind of consideration and reconsideration going on with CKD of uh, the guidelines and when do we treat when do we treat hypertension? No, just in general, anemia, hypertension, all oh. the proteinuria, all the different things that, you know, those are constantly being revisited and trying to determine the, the mor morbidity and mortality on these CKD patients. Oh, I think he's absolutely right. I mean, it's um, uh, the more we know, the more, you know, flexible, flexible we have to be in changing our guidelines and modifying them as we move forward. What about the human component of giving this drug? The people who are administering Varenz and CA1, is there any risk to uh, to people within the household? Not any real direct risk that, that we're aware of. There is a warning for pregnant women. And um, then I think you'd you just have to use common sense and, you know, washing your hands and um, trying to reduce human contact to the drug, but there's no known obvious risk. This is, this is all great news, oral administration and, you know, not a huge risk of people doing it at home. We're not doing injections uh, and things along those lines. One thing we have, um, we haven't talked about yet is the fact that we keep calling it Varenzin CA1 indicating conditional approval. So for people listening, can you remind us what conditional approval means? Right. So um, drugs that are conditionally approved have been proven to be safe by the FDA, and there is a reasonable expectation of efficacy for treating an unmet need of a serious condition. So in this case, it's anemia of chronic kidney disease. When a drug has conditional approval, it must be used according to the label. So in this case, extra label use that would be prohibited is not giving the pause. You have to give the pause after 28 days, a minimum pause of seven days, and you can't give it to dogs. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it's a really important reminder when we're working with these conditionally approved 
medications because it is so important that they come on the market. But of course, as veterinarians, we're so used to using things off label. Uh, that it's a good reminder to say this is not one of those that we can use off label. You know, we'll we'll see what happens in the future with all of that. We talked a little bit about polycythemia and, you know, giving the pause to help avoid polycythemia and all of that. We also touched on hypertension um, and some other potential side effects we need to look out for. What kinds of specific monitoring should we be doing in these patients? Well, of course, we want to monitor their PCD and make sure that it's not going above 45 um, and that we're um, getting a, a, a response to the medication. Um, we also want to watch their iron stores. Uh, there's unfortunately not a great test available for iron. Um, and so most of us just give 50 milligrams of iron dextran every month when we're managing cats. Um, there is a new drug available called Naroquin and Naroquin is ferric citrate. And again, it's avoiding the needle. We can give an oral drug also has a dual effect of being a really good phosphate binder. And so that would be another option for um, giving concurrently with these medications to help manage the iron stores. And then, of course, we want to watch for hypertension, as we mentioned earlier, and maybe be um, a little bit more, I don't want to say aggressive, maybe assertive with the treatment so that we started a little bit earlier and, and um, make sure that they don't, they don't become hypertensive when we're managing them. Sure. And am I hearing you correctly? When we're using a, dr- a drug like Forensin CA1, is it a good idea we should just go ahead and have them either on iron dextran injections or on Naraquin, some sort of iron supplementation? Yes, they need, they're using their iron stores to um, produce these red blood cells. And so they need to have those iron stores replenished and, and maintained. Unfortunately, we do have, like you said, some good options for that. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I mean, we've talked about a lot of exciting things here that, you know, an oral medication with a relatively easy dosing schedule, um, you know, monitoring parameters that we're, we tend to be pretty comfortable with in CKD kitties. Uh, I guess, you know, the next obvious question would be, when will it be available? Soon, hopefully in the next month or so. Oh, that's so exciting. Well, Shelly, Dr. Beaton, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining me to go over a lot of the the high points and important information around Varenz and CA1. I think a an unmet need for a life-threatening condition sums it up perfectly. I mean, the idea of having a good option to manage anemia in these kitties, especially when we're finding out that we may need to be managing it sooner than we have been in the past is really exciting. So Thank you so much for joining me. Are there any final thoughts you want to share? Um, Not really, other than, you know, again, we're all very excited about the possibility of this drug being available for us. And I really appreciate you inviting me here today. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us for this episode. I want to say a huge thank you to Dr. Vaden for all of the wonderful information. And of course, thank you to Elenco for making this episode possible. For more episodes like this, click on the Education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.